following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Again, an extensive analysis of the 22 arcana of the Kabbalah. The term arcana is plural. The singular aspect of this term is arcanum. Arcanum refers to a type of knowledge which is for the initiated or a kind of knowledge that's mysterious for the average person. It's a sort of science or understanding that one has to be introduced to. So when we study the 22 arcana, we're studying 22 laws or 22 mysteries that we have to be initiated into, that we have to enter into experientially in order to understand them. The 22 arcana of the Kabbalah are 22 laws. We know in the Judeo-Christian tradition that we have 10 primary laws, or Ten Commandments, that are discussed very commonly, but there are twelve more. These twenty-two laws, or twenty-two arcana, contain the entire process of religion, or in other words, religare, which is Latin for union. So the twenty-two arcana are steps or clues which illuminate religion itself or this process of union. In the Judeo-Christian tradition and of course in the Gnostic tradition, these 22 laws have been symbolized in various ways. We've already mentioned the Ten Commandments which are the first and most obvious representation of these 22 steps. But there's another less commonly recognized aspect or symbolism, symbol of these 22 arcana. And these are the book of the tarot. The tarot cards, or the images of the tarot, form a book. 22 images. And these 22 images symbolize and represent 22 arcana, steps, laws, mysteries, which the initiate needs to understand and know in order to understand and know the path to the self-realization of the being. These 22 arcana are also symbolized and represented in the 22 characters of the Hebrew alphabet. 
each character of this alphabet also symbolizes and represents different laws and aspects of the path to the self-realization of the being. So for us who aspire to comprehend and understand that path, to enter that path, and to make it manifest in us, it's vital that we understand the nature of these 22 laws. Within them is the path itself. More than that, the, the foundation upon which we work in Gnosis is direct experience. The term Gnosis itself indicates that. Gnosis is not a mere belief or a theory. It is a science of direct experiences or a science of, of a method which leads one to one's own direct experience of the truth. The truth itself is the 22 arcana. So to experience directly the nature of truth, we study these 22 arcana in order to help us organize our own experiences, to understand them. When we study the Judeo-Christian tradition, and we look into the book of Genesis, we see that there is a great symbol in the very beginning of the book, the first few chapters. We find two trees in the Garden of Eden. The first tree is the tree of life. Now this is a symbol of the Kabbalah or the science of numbers which we will begin to analyze today. Kabbalah is a map of our own consciousness. It is also a map of the universe. The universe and our consciousness are reflections of one another. And the Kabbalah encodes that it symbolizes that. So the tree of life in the Bible is a symbol of this science of numbers. And of course, anyone who studies the Bible knows numbers play a huge role throughout the Bible. There are always seven of this and three of that. Huge importance to numbers. So these 22 arcana are the science of understanding the symbols of those numbers in order to help illuminate our own path. The second tree is the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge of good and bad, or good and evil. This tree contains the forbidden fruit, which in the Bible is clearly... Um, it is clearly stated that we should not eat of the forbidden fruit. So in order to understand what that means, we need to know what the tree of knowledge is in us. The term knowledge, of course, is the word gnosis. Gnosis itself is the root of the term knowledge. But in Hebrew... It is the term da'at, D-A-A-T-H. The tree of life, which is the first tree that I described, is the Kabbalah, which is symbolized in its most common representation as ten spheres and these ten spheres are organized on a structure of three columns on which hang three triangles. So already we see numbers. The Kabbalah then, these ten spheres, or sephiroth, represent levels of consciousness and aspects of our own inner psychology. The tree of knowledge, or da'at, is, is, is one more sphere which is hidden within the tree of life. These two trees are said to share the same roots. They're closely interrelated. So when we study Gnosis, we study religion, it's important for us to understand 
We have to study both these trees together. The tree of life is the study of our own consciousness, the study of our own psyche, the study of our own inner being. And the tree of knowledge is the science of alchemy. It is the secret wisdom or secret knowledge which illuminates the tree of life. The sphere of that, or the tree of knowledge, has always been hidden. It has always been esoteric, or something that one must be initiated into. So that is the great arcanum. It is that truth of truths, the secret of secrets. It is what has always been veiled in the temple. It is the ark of Noah and the ark of the covenant the great arcanum. So in the course of these 22 lectures, we'll be examining these two trees continually, comparing them, understanding them side by side. This is Kabbalah and alchemy. These are the two columns of the great hierarchies of God, wisdom and love. That, this secret knowledge or esoteric knowledge related to alchemy, is wisdom. And the tree of life, the Kabbalah, is love. The two columns which form the foundation of the temple or the support of the temple. That temple, of course, is our own soul. The temple of our own living God. To construct and Perfect our own inner temple is the purpose of religion or religare. And the construction of our own inner temple is, is supported by and made strong by the study of these two trees together. The tree of life in ourselves must become fully illuminated. That is self-realization. But that illumination is provided by the tree of knowledge. So these two trees, these two columns, are in itself the science to self-realize the being. The 22 arcana, as I stated, are esoteric or hidden laws. They're symbols. So in the beginning, we always begin with the number one. Today's lecture is about Arcanum 1, which is the magician. So when you observe the first card of the tarot, we see a magician. But who is the magician? We have to understand that. This card is symbolic and imparts to us a vital understanding upon which the basis of of the entire set of arcana rests. The number one is the number which begins. It's unity. It is initiative, the beginning. But the number one emerges from nothing. Really, the number one comes from the zero. When we study the Kabbalah and we look at our map, we see that the tree of life unfolds from the absolute or from this womb of the Divine Mother. That womb is the zero. It is that primordial potentiality. The zero is a profound and ancient symbol. It is potentiality, creation, the ocean from which life emerges. That womb of the Divine Mother gives birth to 
1. So if we see a 1 and a 0, we see the first, the, the beginning, the start. We also see the number 10, 1 and a 0. We also see EO, I-O, which is the core component of the name of the Divine Mother. The one, in this case, is that projective force, that masculine principle, which initiates, which begins. And that one, on the tree of life, in this context, is representing Keter, or the first Sephira. That one, in its emerging from the womb, is truthfully the first trinity, or three in one, which is Keter, Chokmah, and Binah. That three in one is the cosmic Christ, the radiant force which illuminates all of life. He is one, but he is three, and he emerges from the zero, from nothing. This manifestation we call yod heve yod hava or in other words the tetragrammaton four letters in hebrew which represent the father mother we have the character yod he vau he These four letters contain a vast amount of symbolism. But the emphasis that I want to place at this moment is a relationship that exists between the zero, the one, and the yod, the first character of this tetragrammaton. Yod, as a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is actually the tenth letter. So you see we have the number ten here. The one and the zero. The womb and the father. The mother and the father. The Yod is the tenth character. The Yod in itself represents the man. Masculine the phallus, the creative force. It's indicating the number one in a very strong way. And if you Kabbalistically take the number of Yod, which is ten, and you reduce it with Kabbalistic numerology, it is a one, because one plus zero is one. The Yod is the impulse, the masculine force which initiates, which drives, which pushes. When this three-in-one, the Trinity, the cosmic Christ, will unfold itself in order to create, it divides itself. Within the sphere of Binah, we find the Holy Spirit, or this creative impulse, this fire, which wants to give rise to manifestation. Binah divides itself into male, female, into Abba, Aima, Shiva, Shakti, the masculine, feminine manifestation of the One. This is yod he he This is yod he Adam-Eve, the primordial couple, Shiva-Shakti. 
Shiva Shakti, in their union, form Dat, the tree of knowledge. Shiva is the masculine manifestation of this first trinity who is one. Shiva is the three in one himself, but polarized masculine. Shakti, his wife, is the feminine polarization of the three in one. These two polarizations, male and female, unify themselves. They join once again in order to create. And this is that. This is the tree of knowledge. Its first manifestation. The creation that that unfolds, or in other words, that Shiva and Shakti unfold, is their son. Their son is Horus. Osiris and Isis join and produce a son who's Horus in Egyptian symbolism. This son is Chesed on the tree of life, the fourth Sephiroth. Chesed is the magician. Arcanum one is Chesed. Chesed is Atman. He is our own individual, personal father. He has his own father, who is Keter. So you can see that this Arcanum One, which is singular, which is one, which initiates, has depths, has levels. Because our own intimate inner father has his father. Our own being has his being. The being of our being is, of course, that cosmic Christ. The being of our being is Keter. But Keter is three in one. Our intimate, our innermost, Chesed, is manifested in order to perform a certain duty, in order to become a perfect magician. Now it's necessary for us to understand what is a magician. What is magic? The term magician has been grossly degenerated in our modern time. It actually comes from a very ancient root. When I pointed out this term Atman, this has a relationship with the term magician, with its roots. You've probably heard of a Mahatma. Mahatman. Atman, of course, is our own inner father, our own inner spirit. Maha means great in Sanskrit. Mahatman, great spirit, great soul. The term Maha, in its roots, that H can also be a G, Mage, Magi. A Magi is a priest. We know the three Magi from the stories of the Bible, of the New Testament. 
which were three kings or three priests who came from the east to worship the Christ. But the term magi or mage actually comes from ancient Sanskrit and um, is it Babylonian? Remember which one this from? Yeah, Assyrian, Babylonian, and Persian term from mag or maha, and the the magi were worshippers of the sun, priests. The sun, of course, we know is a symbol of the Christ. So the real magician is a priest. And working with magic, real magic, is actually a sacred priesthood, a sacred office. And the real magician is not the terrestrial person. The one who really works with magic is our own inner father. When we look at the symbol of the card, the image of the magician, we're looking at a symbol of our own inner being, our own inner father. We see the magician with a serpent on his forehead. The serpent is a symbol of mastery, a symbol of illumination. He carries in his hand a staff or a rod which symbolizes power. And that rod, that vertical column, is the spinal column. He has one hand up and one hand down. The one hand up is raising the rod, pointing to heaven. The hand down is pointing to the waters beneath his feet, which is an instruction to his son, to his child, which we'll come to. But the form of his figure one up, one down, and his body between, forms the character Alep. Which is the first character of the Hebrew alphabet. Alep, of course, is number one. It's that first character which initiates, which begins. He is in himself that character, Aleph. The being is the Aleph, the Alpha, the first, as far as we're concerned. He is our number one. We are in suffering because we've forgotten him. We're in pain because we neglect our duty to him. When our being becomes once again our number one, first, and we perform our duty in accordance with his directive, we achieve religion, religare. Before the magician is a table. The table has four sides. It forms a cubic shape. The four here represents a number of things represents the four elements that the magician has to command. Anyone who studied anything of what we call magic knows that the magician works with the elements of nature, fire, water, air, and earth. And the great magician is the one who commands those elements in order to perform his will. Moses, for example, was a great magician. Jesus was a great magician. These were initiates who developed the capacity to command the elements of nature, to calm storms, to raise tempests, to to rattle the earth, to have power over the forces of life and death. The terrestrial person is not the one who can do those things. It's the inner being, God. But God, that father, works through the initiate, works through his son, his child. The four sides of the table also represent 
the vehicles through which the being works. So returning to the tree of life, we see the sphere of Chesed, who is one part of a trinity, or three spheres, Chesed being the first or highest part. Next to that is Budi, Geburah, which is our divine soul, divine consciousness, which is a feminine aspect of the being. And next to her is Tiferet, or Manas, which is a masculine aspect of the being. So our innermost, our Atman, our Chesed, has two souls, one masculine and one feminine. But these three are one. The magician perfected is these three aspects perfectly unified. The number one is unity. That's the goal of the magician. Unity. But that unity is in the soul. Below this trinity of the monad, we have the four vehicles that the monad will work through. The first, in descending order, is netza, or the mind, the mental body. The next is hod, emotion, or the emotional body. The, the third is yesod, the energetic body, the vital body, the etheric body. And last is malkut, the physical body. These are the four bodies of sin. The four bodies with which we either create problems or create the soul. These four bodies are the laboratory of the magician. The, the magician works with these four aspects of himself in order to command the elements and reach perfection. For the magician to accomplish his goal, for our inner being to fulfill his own duty, he needs these four vehicles to be perfected, to be perfect vehicles for his purposes. In other words, the terrestrial person has to work. We, of course, inhabit our physical body. The physical body that we have is made possible and is alive because of the being, because of our own inner God. We have this physical body because he gave it to us to serve him. The body is able to live, digest, function, perceive, and act because of these other vehicles which reside within it. The etheric or vital body is the basis of our digestion, all chemical processes, all of the energetic processes, everything that occurs inside of us that gives us life is based upon the vital body, Yasod. That's why Yasod, one reason why, Yasod, or the ninth sphere, is called the foundation. It is the foundation of life. We also have the astral body, which is related to our emotions. And this is the body we use when we dream. When we have a dream, when we fall asleep physically, we begin dreaming, we're actually traveling in our astral body. The physical body rests. The vital body gathers energy in order to restore the physical body. And the rest of us escapes and begins to wander within our own mind. But that wandering is occurring with a vehicle, a vessel. That is the astral body. We also have the mental body, 
related to our intellect or mind. The process of cognition, thought, reasoning. These four parts are the four wheels of the chariot four horses of the chariot, the four aspects of the soul that the magician needs to command. But what is commanding our intellect now? What is it that's driving our emotional well-being now? Who's in control of our emotions Who's in control of our thoughts? Who's in control of our actions? Why is it that when we do something wrong, we always say, oh, that wasn't me? When we lie, when we steal, when we cheat, and we get caught, we say, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why I did that. That just wasn't me. I'm not like that. I'm not that kind of person then who did it? Who is it that's bringing up all the thoughts and feelings that we're having now? The last time we got really angry, who was in charge of that anger? Who was driving and bringing that anger? Was it your being? course not. This is where the work begins. We, as an essence, as a consciousness, as the son of that father, as the child of that father, have to gain control over ourselves. Our consciousness is a portion of the being. It is a spark. It is an embryo that he can work through, but we have to control it. We are a spark of this monad called the essence. The spark is that little bit of conscious will that we have. Sometimes we call it conscience. It's that part of us that knows what is right and what is wrong. Just knows it. Doesn't reason. Doesn't rationalize. Doesn't need anyone to tell. Yes, this is right. No, this is wrong. We just know. That is part of the being. The being speaks through that voice of the conscience. Our job, in order to comprehend and enter into the science of the 22 arcana, is to make that conscience strong. It's made strong by listening to it, by doing what is right, and by stopping wrong actions, wrong thoughts, wrong feelings. This is an effort of will. In the Kabbalah, on the Tree of Life, we look at the the trinity of the monad, we see this sphere, Tiferet, which I mentioned is manas, the human soul. Really, Tiferet is the center of will for us. Tiferet is the knight, the warrior, who fights on behalf of the magician. In this case, we can look at the ancient Arthurian legends. Merlin the magician, of course, is the innermost. Arthur, the king, is the warrior, right? Arthur is actually the king who's the being. Lancelot would be the warrior. Lancelot is the one who fights. And, of course, Guinevere is the divine soul. But will... Is, this, is the clue. Will to change. Will to establish control over our own psychology. 
The Master Jesus said, Ye must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We are not perfect. Many people nowadays believe that this was a symbolic thing that he said, that we become perfect by believing in him. But it's not said that way. It's said very clearly, ye must be perfect. This is a very direct statement. And part of a talk in which he's discussing, anyone who has adultery cannot enter heaven. Anyone who criticizes, who kills with their words, cannot enter heaven. Murderers, fornicators, adulterers cannot. The reason is, heaven is in levels, but is the realm of perfection, perfected beings. How can we who are imperfect enter there? We cannot. We enter there by becoming like them, perfected in ourselves, which is a work of will. The innermost, the magician, needs to dominate nature, to control nature, to be a king, to be a priest who dominates the elements. But in order for him to do that, he has to arrange the elements on the table in front of him. The sword is a symbol of will. The sword is the weapon that the initiate must use in order to conquer himself. The vase, the jar, a chalice, has two aspects. It symbolizes the mind, which must be cleansed. It also symbolizes the feminine sexual organ, the yoni. In like manner, the sword represents the masculine sexual organ. And third on the table is a moon. The moon has to be converted into a sun. What this means is that our lunar psychology, lunar being mechanical and belonging to nature, belonging to the realm of the animal, has to be converted into solar, being part of the kingdom of the sun, Christic. The moon in us, the lunar forces, have to be conquered and transformed into solar forces. These are the works that are performed on the table. All of this is empowered and made possible by the Holy Spirit, who's symbolized in the card by a bird under the table. Now, all of this work is occurring on top of the waters, the lowest aspect of the card. And inside the waters, we see a perfect stone, a perfect cube. This is pointing to masonry. And the work of the mason is to perfect the stone. The stone resides in the water. It is the sophic hydrolith, the water stone of wisdom. What is a stone and a liquid? What is both stone and liquid? Mercury. Mercury is the symbol of alchemy, which indicates the sexual energy. The stone that we have to perfect is our own sexual matter. It is the foundation stone of the temple. Those columns of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge are founded upon this stone, the foundation stone which the whole temple is built on. The foundation stone is here in the waters, in the lowest part of this card. This corresponds to the ninth sphere, Yasod, which is, of course, related to our vital and etheric body. If we place the tree of life as a diagram over our physical body, Yasod points to and indicates the sexual organs. Yasod, the ninth sphere, is the root of the tree of knowledge. It is where we work with the science of alchemy. 
learning how to transmute our sexual matter, to transform our animal instinctive sexual forces, lunar forces, into solar, perfected, divine and heavenly sexual forces. Sex is natural to the human being. It's part of the creation of God. But sex performed under divine will. Under the auspices of the magician. Who needs to manage those forces in order to realize himself. The magician then, standing in the form of the Aleph, this Hebrew character, is that force which initiates. He has the prayer to um, become that perfect Aleph. When we analyze this character of Aleph and we disarrange its parts in order to understand it, we see that it's actually made of three primary aspects. And of course, when we see that it has three aspects, we're reminded immediately of the Trinity, the three in one. The Trinity, which is the basis of the being. These three aspects are, in fact, two yods and a vow. Hebrew characters. The yod is that masculine, projective, creative principle. The vow is the sixth letter of the Hebrew letters. When we count the spheres, we see that the sixth sphere is Tiferet, the human soul. The magician has to work with the two yods and the vow in order to form the perfect Aleph. When we understand that, then we can see how he does it. The first yod, we understood to be in that, that hidden sphere between Bina and Chesed. That first yod is the upper Eden. It is that, but related to the being. This is the potential for the being to create and manifest. This is that first yod. The upper Eden. The second yod is in the lower Eden, in Yasod, in our own sexual waters. So we see that the yod, this masculine projective force, is the, the fire or the potentiality which exists within the waters. In the book of Genesis, we read that the Spirit of God moved across the waters, on the face of the waters. These waters represent the upper Eden, in that. These are the waters of Genesis from which creation emerges as an act of magic. This magical creation in that is a creation that our own being performs in order to begin his manifestation. The inner Christ, manifest as Shiva Shakti, works in these waters of Genesis. This is that first Yod, the Yod of Yod Hevau He. The, the creation that emerges from that is vow. Vow, we know, is related to the human soul, to Chesed, who is one with the part of the monad. That vow is the spinal column. The human soul.
And the last, or the second, Yod, is in Yasod, in the waters of sexuality. So the magician, the innermost, has to work with the will of his human soul to bring together the two Yods, the lower Eden and upper Eden, in order to reach perfection. The combination of those elements produces the Aleph, which is the perfect magician. And this is all an act of will. This can only be done when we, as the terrestrial person, cooperate. We have to work with the waters of Genesis. We have to work with the two trees. We have to transmute the waters of the lower Eden. We have to comprehend the waters of the upper Eden. The magician performs his ritual, his priestly duty, by managing the forces arranged on the table, these four elements. He performs his magic or his works upon this altar. And these works are hermetic magic, which are works related to the mind in Netzach. He performs his works of natural magic or ritualistic magic in the sphere of Hod related to the astral plane or the emotional body. And to unify them and empower them, he works with the process of sexual magic in Yasad. You could say in other terms, the hermetic priesthood, the natural priesthood, and the sexual priesthood. These are sacred duties. Sacred duties that the terrestrial person performs on behalf of the innermost. The innermost empowered by the innermost for the benefit of the innermost. What this means for us, we have to begin to enforce will to develop our own willpower, to have the capacity to command our own inner nature. And this begins right now. This is not some theoretical or ex extremely complicated numerical idea. In order for your own being, your own inner magician, to arrange the items on the table and to achieve religion, he has to have a vehicle through which he can work. If our own will is trapped in our pride, is trapped in our anger, is trapped in our lust, then the connection to our innermost is lost. It is not present. When we remain a slave of our envy, we're not serving the being. The gospel state very clearly, you cannot serve two masters. And we have to analyze ourselves. With each action that we perform, we need to analyze. On whose behalf am I doing this? On whose behalf am I acting? When we feel the impulse to speak to another person, do we consider why we must speak? On whose behalf? Is it because we're angry? And we want to express our anger? Is it because our feelings are hurt? And we want revenge? We have to question and analyze our every activity in every moment. This is a work of will. Conscious will. Exercised over our three brains 
our intellect, our emotion, and our motor instinctive and sexual aspect. This work of will is a work of attention. In synthesis, you could say, the work of the 22 arcana is a work to perfect attention, to perfect consciousness, to perfect conscience. The work of the magician is to perfect himself. But he can't do that if we remain slave, enslaved by our own pride, our own self-justifications, our attachments, our desires. The innermost, to become that perfect alep, to become that maha atman, that perfect magician, needs us. Some say that this sounds strange, that God needs us. But it's true. We are a part of Him. We don't exist here just by chance or just for entertainment. We exist to fulfill a specific role, a defined duty towards our own innermost, our own inner father. And he, in turn, has his duty. For him to perform his work, we have to do ours. And ours is to become his will. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, we see Jesus gives us this great example, great prayer of tremendous power. Thy will be done. Thy, my inner Father. May the will of my inner being be done on earth, in me, in my physical body, as it is in heaven. That is a process of conquering all of the wills that we have inside, which are opposed to the will of the innermost. My lust does not want what my being wants. My pride wants to be noticed, wants to be admired or envied. My being does not want that. So in moment-to-moment analysis of ourselves, we conquer and comprehend each discursive will that we have inside. Every ego that we have, every psychological aggregate, has its own will. And all of these different wills are not the will of the innermost. To know the will of the innermost, we have to separate ourselves from the ego. When we look back at this card, we see in the superior portion of the card a pair of eyes. Always watching, always looking. These are the eyes of the Father. Every action we perform, every thought we think, every feeling that we entertain is not just ours to observe. Our being is inside of us. Your own inner Father is the root of your existence. He knows every atom that you inhabit. So, obviously, he knows your thoughts and your feelings as well. How is it that we can allow negative thoughts and negative emotions to flourish in our mind? How is it that we can allow them to continue to express themselves with their resentment, their criticism, their desires, their accounts against other people. So-and-so did this to me, so-and-so did that to me. I didn't deserve that. 
We allow all of that to persist in our interior. And from time to time, we take a little break from our inner song to pray. Somehow we think that the moment we stop to pray, then God's there. God's only there when we pray to him, is what we think. So we're going all day long, imagining scenes of lust, imagining scenes of getting vengeance against our enemies, real or otherwise. And then we take a little break and say, oh God, I remember you. And we think somehow that that's the only thing he sees. Somehow that moment of prayer. Well, I'm sorry to point out to you, as painful as it might sound, that he's there all the time. So those 23 hours and 59 minutes that you were lost in fantasies about the past and future, dreaming about making money, or dreaming about becoming famous, your being is there too. These eyes are always watching inside of you. Will needs to be there all the time in us. The will to change. The will to fight against our own stubborn animal nature. Never forget the presence of your being inside. If you maintain the continuity of the awareness and remembrance of your own inner God, you are establishing self-remembering. The remembrance of the inner self. The remembrance of the being. This is to treat every moment as a moment spent inside of a temple. To feel within yourself that in each instant you are in the presence of the most unimaginable divinity. And when you're confronted with the impulses of your own lust, your own fear, your own hate, recall and remember the presence of your own inner God and exercise the will of your consciousness to remember Him, to observe yourself. That effort is the foundation of the entrance into the direct understanding of the 22 arcana. These eyes are always watching, always present, always observing. And you see in their shape the symbol of infinity the symbol of the infinite. That infinite, of course, is the being of the being. When we look at the way nature unfolds on the tree of life, we see that this first triangle of Kater, Hokmah, and Binah is related to the infinite. That is the being of the being. The infinite manifestation which comes out of the unmanifest. When the being is working, when our own innermost is working to unify himself as Alep, to work in the waters of the upper Eden, which are the Akashic energies, the Akashic Tattva, and working in the lower Eden, in the waters of Genesis, of transmutation, sexual matter. The innermost is doing that as a work of will. As his son, or daughter, the human soul, is entering into initiation. The process of initiation, as a soul, is a process of working with these waters, working with the psyche, and working with laws. In this process, the initiate 
is trying to work with these two waters directly. In relation to the upper, the initiate has to meditate in order to comprehend the Akashic Tattva, the higher aspects of energy related to the being. Meditation is how we become closer to God. By concentrating on God, by remembering God, by focusing on our inner being, we're working with forces to bring us closer to Him. If we forget Him, we will not become closer to Him. But the more we remain in self-remembering, the more we meditate, to comprehend the nature of the being, the more we're working directly with the waters of the upper Eden to penetrate and comprehend Him, to understand Him who's inside. At the same time, we have to work with the waters of transmutation through the magic of the Asad. And in this way, by transmuting our sexual forces, we're gathering the energies and forces of the Holy Spirit, which brings us closer to God. When we reject that, when we fornicate, when we abuse of our sexual forces, we become further and further from God. More and more emptiness in our hearts. More and more loneliness more of a spiritual vacuum. This void, painful void that we will feel in the heart when God does not fill us. To become closer to God then, we work in these two ways. Transmutation and meditation. This creates a dynamic exchange. The center of which is the human soul as a work of will. That human soul is the vow. Right? That character vow, which symbolizes the spinal column upon which those fires of Yasod must rise. That constant flow and exchange of energy produces a current fueled by meditation and transmutation. And that current... is what draws together the two yods to the vow to create the perfect magician. The waters of the upper and lower Edens merge in the perfected vow or the human soul. And that Aleph, or the innermost, as the transformer of that energy, moves This is why in the graphic that we have in the internet, we see the left spinning. That spin is produced by will. Will over desire. Will over nature. Will over the four elements. That is the work to arrange the elements on the table. That is the work to create the perfect LF. Any questions? Can we say, let's uh, say that ego and being cannot coexist. Right. Yet we stress that today is that the being is always present. How is that possible? Because you still have an essence. You still have a consciousness. Your being is in you because you still have a connection with him. But he's only in you to a certain point. A very small percentage relative to the amount of consciousness that you have free of ego. If you became completely absorbed in your ego, 100%, your being becomes divorced from you and you fall from the tree of life like a leaf falling off of a tree. Then the being isn't there. You just become dead matter, a leaf, tossed by the winds of karma to be recycled by nature. So long as you maintain some percentage of free consciousness inside, 
you maintain the connection to your being. The more consciousness you free through performing the work, the stronger the connection to your being becomes. And of course, the work in the end is to eliminate all the ego so the being can completely inhabit you and incarnate in you. But it's a process of steps to reach that. That makes sense? You think about that. <laughs> you know, say you're waking up a more percentage, you know, of the consciousness, say. Mm-hmm. But you still have that much more ego, right? Yeah. This it's a long... What you sounded was that ego is present even in your... I mean, your, uh, the being is always present in your lust and your anger. And you, know, you, you said it's wrong. It's always present. Okay. It's true. That the being is present even when your ego is there. And the reason is because your consciousness is trapped inside of that ego. Your consciousness belongs to the being. Your being is the animating fire in every cell of your body. Your being is the animating fire of everything that you are. He is also in your ego, but as Lucifer. So he knows you. Inside and out. It's the law of three is one of the fundamental laws that nature is based upon. The Trinity is a form of um, balance. You have a first force which initiates, which begins. You can also call them notes. This would be the note do, the note that begins something. But any time you have a projective force, you immediately imply a receptive force, right? So you have projective and receptive. So then you have two forces that are opposing one another. In order to create balance, you have a third, which creates harmony. So that is just a fundamental um, structure which you find everywhere in nature. And that's one of the things that indicates and shows the intelligence that resides in all matter, in all phenomena. So when we study Kabbalah, we're just putting in a symbolic form something that you can directly perceive in almost any aspect of nature that you look at. Make sense? Yeah. It's a symbol of how things work in nature. For example... No, it's not so much related to that. No, 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 no. That's a different, different point of view. The Trinity, in this sense, is the law of creation. How things are created. So when we look at groups of threes, we're looking at how certain forces working in harmony, create. When you're talking about dimensions, this is another thing. So, there are dimensions within dimensions. But within those, the law of three is functioning. Is it dangerous to practice transmutation without meditation? The question is very interesting. One can practice transmutation and not meditate, and certain results will occur. To transmute means to harness a force and change it. Trans is the basic um, suffix or prefix there, which indicates from one thing to another. And mutate means change, to transmute. But, firstly, we have to grasp Who performs the transmutation? Who is it that is the magician that changes lead into gold? Who is that alchemist? It's the being, the innermost. The one who performs magic is the inner being. 
The one who transmutes the energy is the inner being. The one who performs the ritual or empowers the mantra is the inner being. We as a terrestrial person are just a vessel, a vehicle. We can perform the exercise of a ritual and it will have no effect. We can perform the exercise of transmutation and it will have no effect if the being is not there, if the will of the being is not within it. To know the will of the being requires that you speak his language. The, the language of the being is symbolic. And it's very sophisticated. That language is the Kabbalah. That language is numbers. That language is in the images of the Tarot. Many other symbolic forms that the being will speak through. If we perform an exercise of transmutation, it's good. Because this is what the being needs. But the fruit of that exercise is given out by the being himself. The magician, the one who has that power, will not give the fruit to someone who does not deserve it. That's why we read in the book, The Mystery of the Golden Blossom, when the Master Samael and Vior says that the Divine Mother never rewards treason and there's a story given of a person who is a famous Gnostic instructor who spoke beautifully about the teaching, who was practicing alchemy and transmuting his sexual forces, but was not rewarded by his Divine Mother. Why? Because he did not meditate. He did not comprehend himself. The Divine Mother cannot reward him the fruits of transmutation because he did not understand how to use it. He was remaining trapped in egotistical desires. Said another way, gnosis is not mechanical. Self-realization is not mechanical. The process of awakening the Kundalini is not a simple theorem that says, if you take A and add it to B, you will get C does not work that way. Gnosis, or the realization of the self, is an act of will of the innermost, of God. For us to receive illumination, understanding, power, transmutation, comprehension, any of the fruits of these practices, all of that is given by the innermost. So yes, you can transmute, but if you don't meditate, if you don't comprehend yourself, your being will give you nothing. Because your being needs you to become perfect. And perfection is achieved through comprehension of error, comprehension of oneself, comprehension of phenomenon. If you don't understand why you have your anger and how your anger makes you behave, then you will remain angry. If you don't understand why pride is a sin, you will remain in sin. And your being, God, will never give power to a sinner. The magician will not give power to a fornicator or an adulterer. The Christ cannot free someone who remains identified with their own selves. Your question? Okay, meditation in this sense, what I'm referring to is conscious comprehension without the interference of the ego. Conscious, meaning with the consciousness. This Self-observation is the basis of it, yes. But real meditation is the activity of the consciousness free of ego. Consciousness has to be understood in this case to know what that means. 
That means that to be in real meditation, there's no I. There's no me. There's no ego. There's no pride. There's no anger. Hmm? You have to learn the science of meditation, how to separate from the ego, how to observe the ego as a free consciousness. In other words, you have to learn how to enter into the state of dhyana or pratyahara, which is a silent mind. And from that process of dhyana, dharana, and samadhi, we then learn how to activate the consciousness and be free from the animal mind. In that state, we are will. We are manifesting and experiencing the two aspects of the being as soul, divine soul and human soul, divine consciousness and human consciousness. That is what meditates. And to access that, you have to separate yourself from intellect, from emotion, from sensation, from all these lower parts. And this is a discipline. There are many techniques that can lead you to that experience, whether from Zen or from Buddhism or from Hinduism, even Christianity. Many techniques. But the essential experience remains the same. We have to become free of the ego in order to comprehend the ego itself. The ego cannot comprehend the ego. My pride cannot comprehend itself. Only my consciousness can, because my consciousness is part of the being. Another question? On the card, there's a symbol above the eyes. Can you explain what this represents? The symbol above the eyes is a magical glyph, which is a kind of encoding of a Kabbalistic principle. You see three, bo- three lines, but they're unified. So it's a symbol of Keter. Keter as a three and one. Next question. The circle with the dot in the middle, does that mean the first differential of matter within spirit? That's right. Next question. Okay. Do you have another question? Mm-hmm. You see, it illustrates the continuity of only one arm that encloses a du- double circuit in the first stroke, while enclosing only one circuit in the second stroke. Right. Yeah, the, the way that that paragraph is written on the website is a little bit contorted, so we're going to work to change that. But the basic meaning there is you see one stroke contains the most of it. And then there's a continuance of that stroke which seals it, right? Well, the, the largest portion of the stroke, when you analyze the symbol of the infinity, you see this large portion which contains the majority. And then there's, there's the continuance of that which seals it. It's just sort of a contorted paragraph that's saying there's this continuance of a line but which encompasses and contains these aspects. Yeah, I think it's just the way the paragraph is written. It's a little it's a little funny. We'll change that. Now in the the supporting materials for today's lecture there's a practice which is given. The practice is to meditate and visualize the symbol of infinity. There's uh, accompanying steps and prayers related to this, to ask for assistance, to meditate and pray on the symbol of the infinity. The beauty of this practice is that it escapes the intellect. It is a kind of koan. If you analyze the practice intellectually, you don't necessarily see why (laughs) this practice is given in the first arcana. What does the eight have to do with the one? How does this practice work? The intellect wants to understand things in a very factual and sort of rigid way. But this practice, the holy eight, is quite potent. If you relax yourself totally, relaxed physically, relaxed emotionally, relaxed mentally. You allow yourself to become a little drowsy. 
and you perform this practice, you're working with hermetic magic related to the mind. You're working to exercise the will of your consciousness to maintain attentive awareness, to maintain concentration. It's up to you. So this practice teaches you in practical terms things that the intellect cannot grasp. So I encourage you to work with this practice. Don't think about it. Don't, don't analyze it with the intellect. Don't try and figure it out with the intellect. Just do the practice. Do the practice. Use your own natural inquisitiveness in the consciousness to investigate it, to explore it, practically speaking, not just as an idea, but actually do it. And the more you make the effort, the more will you put into that effort, the more benefit you will receive. If you do it once, kind of half-heartedly, you probably won't get anything. The work to activate and realize the 22 arcana in oneself is a work of great will. The arcana one is that which initiates. And any beginning is very difficult. To start anything is hard. To start a project, to start a life, To start a new marriage, to start a new job, is hard. The same is true of this type of work. It's difficult. But you have to persist. You have to keep trying. It's a matter of willpower. Relax and make the effort. Your being is with you. Your innermost will help you. But to do that, you have to listen to him. Any final questions? Yeah. What do you think the, uh, the difference is in, say, intuition, will, and consciousness? Difference between intuition, will, and consciousness. In intuition, part of the will is will, part of the intuition is <laughs> consciousness, part of the. Okay. I mean, you get intuition, you say, you know, you have to know you're doing right or wrong. I mean, see, it's intuition that is going to tell you that. Is that part of the will? Is that part of the consciousness? That's a good question. What, what are the differences between will, consciousness, and intuition? In their heart, they're the same. In their essence, they're the same. Consciousness is a continuum of energy. Really, it's the sign of the infinite. That's consciousness. But in us, it is discontinuous. Right? We're paying attention one minute and then we're totally asleep the next. So will comes into play as a effort to contain and focus and direct that consciousness. Okay? So will is like the... I don't know. I don't know of a good analogy. Well, will is the, the, the effort to keep that consciousness flowing in the right way. But intuition is the knowing how to direct it. You see? They're one thing. But when you have an intuition, you know how to direct your consciousness by will. For example, you're walking down the street. He's always walking down the street. And you see an old friend. And you know from past experiences with this person that this person is very negative and loves to gossip. You have consciousness in that moment because you're working to be aware of yourself. 
So you're working on focusing and directing your consciousness. So right there you have conscious attention, where you observe that person. So you're enforcing your will in that second, that moment. Your mind tells you, this person always wants to gossip with me. I should avoid them. But your heart tells you, I need to talk to them. Which one do you do? Most of the time, you probably listen to your mind. Nah, I shouldn't talk to them. They're just going to do this and that. It's going to be terrible. Why should I even bother? But if you listen to your heart, you're listening to the intuition. You might go and find that something happens in the exchange between the two of you that you needed. Could be painful, could be pleasant, whichever. But the distinction has to be, and from moment to moment, if you're paying attention, if you're conscious, you're manifesting will. But you have to listen for intuition to give you guidance how to direct that will, how to direct that consciousness through will. And it's always changing. And the mind will always try to interfere. Always. So the will is control consciousness, control mind. Keep, keep consciousness active. Keep mind passive. It's not easy. But the more you make the effort, the more you maintain the continuity of observation, and the more you maintain the continuity of the remembrance of your being, the more familiar you become. Another question? What about the, um, the uh, symbols, the birds? The bird on the top? Yeah, the birds represent aspects of the Holy Spirit. So in this case, we can say, that the Holy Spirit is that bird, which is part of that upper trinity, right? Bina, the Holy Spirit. Exactly. So we have the Holy Spirit above and below. It's in both aspects. The bird is present there. And in, in the same way, we can relate this to the two Edens, upper and lower. Because the forces of the Holy Spirit are the fires in the waters of the upper Eden, or those Akashic forces. And the fires of the Holy Spirit are in the waters of the lower Eden in our sexual forces. So here we see the presence of that divine force everywhere. One more? Yeah. What is the difference between the Holy Eight and the circle in terms of infinity? Yeah, the... What are you saying? Yeah, that's my sense of it too. The symbol of the infinity is showing an exchange, movement, back and forth. So you're seeing how in the upper upper aspects of the tree of life, you have unmanifest moving to manifest and back. This flux back and forth, manifestation, unmanifestation, cosmic day, cosmic night. That is what the infinity is showing. But that symbol is penetrating all the way through the tree of life. The presence of that exchange back and forth of forces. The symbol of the dot in the circle is, for me, more of a picture of one instant. It's capturing the one, one little photograph, one little frame of that manifestation out of the womb. But in truth, when you look at how the tree functions, it is in constant motion. The manifestation into manifestation is movement. So that's how I understand the distinction between them. Thank you all. We look forward to the next lecture, which will be on Arcanum 2. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. 
All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.